Well, good evening and welcome everyone. I'm glad to have everybody for our third, a third out of four um, COVID healthcare town hall meetings. And what we're going to be doing tonight, we're meeting with Dr. Michelle Katanzaroid. I'm very pleased to have her on board. She's the chief medical officer at the Achievable Health Center, which she's been for the last seven years. Uh, in addition to being a family practitioner, she's also a mother of three. So she has both family experience and medical clinical experience as a family physician. Um, we have collected a, a bunch of questions from the community, things that people are wondering about. Um, we've been talking a lot about COVID, but now that hopefully we're getting to more of the endemic phase of the pandemic, what we're beginning to recognize is that we still have to remember general healthcare practices and that a lot of those have been forgotten along the way while we've been focused on pre pre preventing COVID. Um, so Dr. Katanzarai, thank you for joining us. Um, some of the questions, first question people are wondering about is what precautions should people take who are high risk and now going back to the doctor's office or having to go to the hospital for a medical visit to kind of protect themselves since COVID is still out and about? Yeah, that's a good question, Tom. And I like everybody to think kind of broadly about whether they're high risk. So lots of times we talk about patients who are cancer patients or who are immunocompromised as being high risk. Um, but I also want us to think about people for whom it would just be very difficult to be in the hospital. And if that applies to you or one of your loved ones, then I think we should think of them as high risk as well. Um, and in that situation, I, I mostly just want to reassure you that in doctor's offices and hospitals, people are still going to be wearing masks. They're going to be taking all the precautions uh, to prevent you from catching COVID while you're in that facility. And you should plan to wear a mask too. Um, N95 masks definitely provide great protection against COVID-19. Um, and there are a lot more places where you can get them and get them for free, uh, including up at Achievable. We have some you can have if you need them. Um, and I know Westside's done a good job handing them out too. So um, especially for uh, those of you or family members who are high risk um, in some way, I, I do recommend continuing uh, to wear good quality masks. So I know many people uh, during the course of this pandemic have avoided or missed routine preventative care. Um, and I know me and myself, it's been a great excuse for me not to go to any of my uh, regular dental, dental or doctor appointments. Uh, but now looking at going back, what are those preventative care appointments that people should be thinking about and should be prioritizing and getting back for, for health care screenings? Yeah, yeah. I it's a good question. So I want to point out that sometimes uh, it was those of us who don't particularly like going to the dentist or the doctor who were dragging our feet about getting our preventive care done. And sometimes people were trying really hard to get their preventive care done. And due to COVID, you know, scheduling, visits became remote and people weren't able to get in for, for care that they really were on top of. So uh I think this applies to both kinds of people. Uh, it's time to get in for an annual physical if you haven't been seen in the last year. Um, and at that time, your doctor or nurse practitioner should be able to go over with you what the recommended screening tests are for you. Probably you'll need some blood work, probably depending on your age, uh, different kinds of cancer screening. Um, and making sure you're up to date on all the other immunizations now that you've gotten your COVID vaccine. Um, so those are the kinds of things that you should expect to check in about. Um, also just checking in on your blood pressure and your blood sugar and your weight. And, um, lots of us, uh, had, um, big changes in our schedules due to COVID. We spent a lot more time at home and maybe a lot more time on the couch. Um, and so it can be, um, a good time to think about healthier habits again now too, that it's a little easier to get out. Tom, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, for answering that. And, and I feel like you're speaking directly to me right now, Dr. Gatanza, right? Cause I, I have been somewhat of a couch potato and realized that I may have gained a few extra pounds. I'm saying um, what I need to hear. <laughs> the, 
You know, one of those things that that uh, that people had asked, and I, I also wonder. You go to a, a your general physical appointment, and the doctor always asks, "Do you have any questions?" I never feel like I have the right questions. Are, are there questions, especially now, kind of post pandemic, things that we should be kind of asking our doctor about, or or informing the doctor if if we have not seen them in a while, things that we should be talking to them about or asking them about. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think in the before you go to the doctor's appointment, even just taking a few minutes to think about, is there anything about my health I'm concerned about, that I have questions about, that refills on my medication, just sort of the whole picture ahead of time and jotting down notes. I, I will tell you, my patients who prepare ahead of time, and sometimes they have support people who help them prepare ahead of time what their questions are. Um, they make sure they get all of their questions answered, uh, which is very helpful for both of us. So um, it's a good habit to get into. Um, I, instead of finding yourself rushing to get into the door in the door on time and, okay, I made it to my physical, take a little bit of time ahead of time and think about what you need. Um, I think something that's often overlooked is our mental health and something that we may not be thinking about uh, when we go in for a physical, but um, I think it's a good time to check in with yourself. How have I been doing? Am I feeling down? Am I more anxious? Am I sleeping well? Uh, are my moods really affecting my life? Uh, it's a good, you may be asked about that at your physical appointment, how your mood is. Um, and if not, I, that's something I think uh, it's a good time to bring up with your doctor. Um, if you've been struggling with anxiety or depression or any other mood issues, which again, with the pandemic, lots of us have. You know, it's interesting. And, and some of the questions from the community are, are just on that subject. Uh, one, one person asked it, what is the difference between like an anxiety panic attack and a heart attack? Like when, when should you seek emergency medical help when you, if you're having to, to be able to distinguish between those two? It can be really difficult to distinguish between the two of those, uh, especially when you're in the middle of it, or if it's the first time that you felt that feeling. Um, so I would say if you're feeling something terrifying in your body, it's a good idea to get checked out because it's hard to know what's happening. Um, there are some clues that I would use if somebody's talking to me about what's happening. So people who are having heart trouble, usually those symptoms will be worse when they're exercising or when they're active. So if you have a feeling in your chest when you go up the stairs that stops when you rest, that makes me much more concerned about your heart than something that comes on when you're sitting around or having dinner or even having an argument with somebody. Um, so when somebody's telling me a story about what's happened to them, those are the kinds of things I listen for. Um, but when it's you and you're, if you have something scary and terrifying that you don't understand in your body, then I think it's a good idea to get medical help. Another question we had on this subject, someone's asking if, if, if I feel depressed, when should I seek medical attention? Um, and also kind of querying, what does depression look like? Like, how can you distinguish that? Yeah. Depression can look lots of different ways. Um, in, in different people. Um, so some people feel really sad and might cry easily. Some people get really irritable and frustrated easily. Um, some people don't sleep well. Some people's speech gets slowed down so that their thinking feels slow and their speech feels slow. Um, so what it looks like in someone can, feel, can look really different. Uh, but if you think you might be depressed, I think it's a good idea to talk to your doctor right away about that um, because um, hopefully that person will have resources for you that they can help you um, learn more about what your symptoms might mean and how to cope with them and medication if that might be helpful. Um, so just like if your shoulder hurts, and, you know, at what point do I go to the doctor when my shoulder hurts? Well, when it really starts bugging me, then I go to the doctor. I think it's the same thing with depression. When my mood is really just 
you know, affecting me, it's bothering me, it's a good time to bring it up with your doctor. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to use this as a shameless plug also on, on March 24th, we're going to be meeting with a, uh, a mental health team to talk about mental health care in the time of COVID. So uh, I really encourage folks to come back also for that, because we're going to be talking much more in depth about mental health. And the the only thing that I would add, uh, I guess I can weigh in on this as well as a psychologist. <laughs> I, I the, almost passed it over to you. Like, why are you asking the, me? <laughs> uh, um, you know, what, what, anytime you have like a really significant change in your usual habits, and one of the, one of the key indicators that a lot of people talk about with depression is um, just things that they're normally interested in. They like to go out with friends. They like to go bowling. And suddenly they just have no interest in doing anything. And they just feel like, blah, just don't really, you know, do you want to go out to movies? Not really. So things that are usually interesting, suddenly they're just not interesting anymore. And what you really be, and sometimes that can happen, situational things can happen. And if it happens for a day or two, that's not unusual. But if you feel like this pervasively for weeks, that this is like what Dr. Gutanz is saying, this is something that you're, you're concerned and you want to bring up. Like I've been feeling this way for some time and this is like not just a day or two. So I would add that. Um, and I always going to have to come back to COVID, unfortunately. And one of the other questions that we had was, um, what, did, what does it look like? Do we know some of the long-term effects of some of the medic, new medications that they're using to treat COVID symptoms, like the antivirals oh. and that? Yeah. No, I don't think we know yet uh, is the, the short answer. Um, Another important piece, I would say, so there's a um, the new oral medication from Pfizer, for example, Paxlovid is the name of it, and they're, they've been talking about it in the news a fair amount lately because they're trying to make it easier to get that medication if you test positive for COVID. There are a lot of drug interactions with that particular medication, and uh and so I would be cautious if you're a person who's on medications for other things, uh, make sure that somebody really reviews your medications before you start taking uh, any of those uh, medications for COVID, but particular the, particularly the pills, um, because it, there's some very unsafe uh, combinations that are pretty common. Another question we had, is now the time to insist on moving forward with procedures uh, that had been scheduled and that were put off due to COVID. Is now the time to kind of revisit those procedures? I would say yes, uh, unless something has changed that you you know feel differently about having the procedure. I think this is a good time um, to get things taken care of. That being said, lots of people feel like this is a good time to get things taken care of, and so it can take a little bit of time to get things scheduled unfortunately. Um, but yes, and, and I like the word insist in that, in that question, um, because uh, I appreciate when patients uh, advocate for themselves and are, um, and are ready to sort of say, this is what I need and help me make that happen. So I think insisting is, is a good thing at this point. Speaking of the word insist, uh, another question that we had, what if my doctor only insists on seeing me on Zoom. I mean, is that okay? Is that sufficient? Or should should we be advocating to be seen in person at this point? Yeah, I um, I think different patients and different physicians have different comfort levels with with remote visits. I personally don't like them, uh, and I know some of the other doctors I work with very much like them. Um, I, there's something about being in the same room with someone that feels much more uh, useful than being on Zoom. Although this is lovely and I'm glad to be here with you all. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> this is not a doctor's appointment though. To not a doctor's appointment. <laughs> so um, if you haven't been seen by a doctor in person in the last year, I, or if you have a chronic medical condition like high blood pressure, diabetes, or um or there's something different about how you're feeling, I think it's worth insisting on being see seen in person. If what you're running into is, well, they only are offering a remote visit for now, I would go ahead and schedule that appointment and then say at that appointment, I really think I need to be seen in person. And 
I think most places the doctors have the ability to then say, yes, I agree with you. You need to come in. If you do that, you make, t- you know, you kind of meeting them halfway and going to the remote visit and then saying, I really want to be, I really need to be seen in person and you're getting still resistance. Um, I, I would feel uncomfortable with that too. Follow up question to that. Should I be scared to go back to see my medical doctor in his office, his or her office? No, I don't think so. So real, and I would say what you should look for is people still following reasonable COVID precautions. So you should still see medical staff wearing masks and washing their hands frequently, and you should wear your mask. And in that situation, and you know, there shouldn't be crowded waiting rooms with people coughing. And, you know, uh, if things look okay from that standpoint, then I, there's no reason for you to feel worried about going back to the doctor. Another concern someone had brought up is I feel like my doctor is not really following up uh, with my concerns or listening to me. Like what, what, what do you advise doing in that case? So uh, my, unless it's me and which case, <laughs> did this come from my patient? Um, I think um, what I appreciate when somebody feels uncomfortable with something that's happened in a visit with me is when they address it with me uh, directly, which I know can be really difficult to do. It can feel very uncomfortable. Um, But it's really powerful to me if a patient says, I feel like you didn't hear me. Or, you know, I was counting on you to call me back about X, Y, or Z, and you didn't call me back. And I'm frustrated. I didn't know what to do. it's very, and then I'm able to respond to them with an apology and, you know, and hopefully do better. If you take that step and address it directly with your doctor and they don't respond with an apology or they are still dismissive, then I think that lets you know that the relationship isn't one that you can continue to work with. You need to be able to trust that the doctor is listening and that they're going to follow up with you. And if you can't, uh, then you probably will need to find a new doctor because it's probably the most important thing about a doctor is whether you feel like they're listening to you and can trust you uh, and you can trust them. And my, and my guess is having survived medical school, internships, residencies, general practice, um, doctors for the most part probably develop thick skins. And I don't see as a thin skinned group of folks that can't handle a little feedback <laughs> Would, would I be right in that? I, I think for the most part, that is true. Yes. <laughs> um, people keep saying how important it is to keep up with medical care, um, but doctors seem to be planning appointments very far out or asking or referring you to go to ER or urgent care. So there's there seems like there's a duality of messages. Hurry up and get this done, and yeah, we'll schedule you for three months from now. Yep. I, I think... Yes, I agree. I think it's true. I think it's true. So, uh, from a health, from a public health standpoint, we think it's really important that everybody catch up on all this stuff that they didn't do before. And if everybody is trying to catch up on the stuff they didn't do before at the same time, then the system gets kind of bogged down and overloaded. So, what I would say is, if you're a pretty healthy person who's maybe a little bit behind on their screening tests, waiting a month or two or three for that appointment is not very harmful. Uh, You can wait and get it done and it's not a big deal. If you're a person with a chronic medical condition like diabetes or heart disease and you haven't been seen by a doctor in six or in nine months, and then it's time to be a little bit more insistent about getting that care. Okay, it makes sense. Um, talking about putting things off. Uh, so thinking now about getting flu shot, shingles shot, pneumonia shot. Um, can you just knock those all in, in one day, or should this? How far apart should you spread these things? Um, those three, you can get them all knocked out in one day. Um, you might have a sore arm, uh, but besides yeah. that, those three can easily go together. Um, if you don't want to get them all at the same time. I would definitely do the flu shot first because uh, we're kind of 
inching toward the end of flu season. If you want to keep some protection, this is a good time to get it. Um, and flu and pneumonia vaccines we give together all the time. So uh, the pneumonia vaccine tends to have very few side effects. So you could double up on those without probably noticing it. The shingles vaccine tends to be a little rougher for some people. So uh, if you're somebody who likes to get all the pain out of the way at once, it's safe to do them all together. <laughs> if you'd rather spread it out a little bit, you can get the, you can separate them. And there's no time you have to wait between. Okay, so uh, if you're willing to uh, to not have use of one of your arms, you could just knock it out on one day. Perfect. Yes, actually, you'll they won't do all three in one arm, so you'll have band-aids on both arms. Oh, nice. So spread it out. Yeah. Equity of limbs. Yeah. Um, is it is it true that there's speaking of of vaccinations and that, and of course we can't stray totally from the subject, that there may be a, another booster shot being recommended for COVID, and how many do, do you think that we're going to need? So um, for immunocompromised people, they've I think recommended a fourth dose, um, or yeah, have definitely recommended a fourth dose at like a booster dose. So for immunocompromised people, they're supposed to get three first, first, second, and third dose of COVID vaccine and then a booster. Um, and for everybody else, we got two doses and then a booster. Um, right now, the most recent thing I saw was they feel like with the booster, the protection against hospitalization and death is, gonna, is holding up for a long time. I anticipate, you know, news keeps coming on this. And every time I think it's going to be one way, they, you know, I get surprised and it's a different way or vice versa. So um, no recommendation currently for additional boosters for those of you who got two doses plus a booster, but stay tuned. In my experience, as soon as we're done with this, uh, this talk, probably the CDC will come out. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, maybe uh, they're worried about other things right now. So maybe we'll get a little reprieve, but Murphy's Law. So as a parent, caregiver, if you're working with, with, uh, with children, individuals that are not, you know, uh, communicative um, or that tend to be histrionic, so you, you're never really sure when they're crying wolf or not, um, wh what are things that you're looking for as a parent to be concerned when you should actually bring uh, mm -hmm the child or individual to, uh, to the urgent care or to a doctor's appointment? So in my experience, parents are very good at this, at knowing when something's off. Um, sometimes they, you know, sometimes folks are worried and it turns out to be nothing, but their intuition, I, I usually feel like their intuition was good. Like, I'm glad you brought them. If you had told me the story, I would have said to bring them, right? Um, Things definitely to be concerned about are fever, change in the way someone's eating, change in the way someone's using the bathroom, uh, or a dramatic change in behavior. Or, uh, there's a long list of things. Um, people sleeping a lot more than usual or being difficult to wake up, those are really concerning things. Um, That's my short list. I, but really, if you're concerned, it's better to get things checked out. I, if your gut tells you that there's something off, you're probably there's probably something. Okay, good advice. Um, I often hear about this idea, the importance of listening to your body. What does that mean? <laughs> how, would, how would you define that that construct? Huh. Oh. I think people mean it in a lot of different ways. Um, but uh, what I would say a healthy way to think about it is if you're feeling tired, then you should probably rest. If you're feeling hungry, you should probably eat something healthy. Um, so paying attention and not just if you have to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom, not just pushing through because day after day, because there's all this stuff to do and I have to get it done. But really when you start to feel tired, taking a break, um, 
it's a, treating ourselves with kindness, especially for those folks with us who uh, might be caregivers or have a lot of people who depend on them. It can be hard to rest. It can be hard to even notice how your own body is feeling, how your own mind is feeling, um, to take the time to think about that. But it's really important because if we don't, then you know you get you end up getting sick or you frustrated or overwhelmed and you can't cope with the things that really need you. So that's how I interpret that when people are saying it. Um, I hope that answered the question. Is there anything that you'd add on that subject? Because I think you're talking about it in general already. But um, you know we hear a lot um, that taking you know good self care measures, taking care of yourself during this time. Um, Anything that you would add about uh, general recommendations on self-care and taking care of yourself at this point? Yeah, self, uh, self-care, self uh, the word makes me think about things that annoy me, like uh, getting your nails done or like, <laughs> um, going to the spa, which is lovely and lots of people enjoy it, but it's not a thing that is restful to me. Um, so I'm always like, oh, whatever, self-care. But really what I think is important is uh, that you are the only person who will take care of you. And, uh, and you're the only person who knows what you need. So if, when I think about self-care, what I mean is what I just said, when you're tired, make time for yourself to rest. Everybody deserves rest every single day. Uh, and enjoyment and pleasure every single day just because you're a human being, not because you got your list done, not because you finished all of your work that day. Um, I often will say to try to take care of your to patients to try to take care of yourself like you're like your your child. So make sure you eat three meals a day and make sure you have a bedtime and a wake up time in the morning. And lots of things get better uh, when you're able to do those things for yourself. Earlier on, you mentioned about, you know, during a uh, regular physical blood test, things like that. Um, are there specific tests that folks should be asking for that they, if they haven't had an annual physical for a long time or specific immunizations that they may have missed that they should be thinking about getting caught up on? Sure. Yeah, it varies by age. Um, I'll start at the top. So for people 45 and older, you should absolutely ask about colon cancer screening. And nobody ever wants to ask about colon cancer screening, but it is very important. Uh, it, it prevents cancer by catching uh, changes in your colon that could turn into cancer before it happens. So they can absolutely prevent you from developing cancer if you get colon cancer screening done. There's two ways to do it. You can have a colonoscopy, uh, which is done by a specialist in their office um, and requires some sedation, or there's a test that you can do at home that you can get from your primary care doctor. Um, and they can talk to you about the ins and outs of both of those, but please ask about it because it's really important and saves lives. Uh, if you're over 45 and you're a woman, uh, 40 to 45 mammogram is really important. Um, and that's a breast cancer screening test that's done by x-ray. Uh, and your doctor can order that for you. Uh, for people over 40 immunization wise, uh, really just every 10 years should be getting a tetanus vaccine. Um, for people uh, 50 and older now are eligible for shingles vaccine. And then people 65 and older need to get pneumonia vaccine. Uh, everybody should get a flu shot every year. From a blood test standpoint, uh, it, there really isn't good science about routine blood work every year, but we all kind of do it because it feels like we should check on what's happening inside of you. Um, probably you should have your cholesterol checked every few years and then based on what medications you take and any other chronic issues you have, there are blood tests that should be done. Uh, they should check your weight and your blood pressure and they should ask you about your mood. Um, we uh, should be doing depression screening at visits too. Um, for younger people, uh, 
there aren't screening cancer screening tests that are required for people under 45 or except for women uh, should be having uh, pap smear cervical cancer screening starting at age 21. Um, it doesn't have to be every year anymore. It depends on your risk factors and the particular kind of test you get, but uh, definitely starting age 21 through age 65. Uh, and uh, the immunizations are the same. So every 10 years for the tetanus booster. Um, so those of you in your early 20s, you probably had your last tetanus booster when you were 12 or 13. So that means you're due now. Uh, that's the one we often forget miss because young people um, aren't thinking about vaccines necessarily and we're not thinking about it or they're not coming to the doctor because they're healthy. So early 20s, you're probably due for a tetanus booster um, and then a flu shot every year. You know, since you mentioned it, and there was a question that had come up before from a family. Um, if you're if you're over 50 and you're getting regular the colorectal screenings that are done like through the mail, yeah. um, do you also need to get a colonoscopy? Do you recommend that, or is it sufficient just to have the colorectal annual colorectal screenings? So they're one or the other is great. Uh, and depends on your preferences. So if you're doing, at, if you're really getting that colorectal cancer screening through the mail every year, that's good, good enough. You know, and I'm, uh, I'm a little depressed by the fact that you that you mentioned the the 50 and older is kind of like the the top age bracket. So um. 45 and older, and I, that includes me too. So. <laughs> um. All right. Well, that's that's the majority of questions that I have for you. Um, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you would like to speak to before we we open it up to any questions from uh, folks attending? Um, no, I don't think so. Well, good. So I was able to sufficiently grill you and ask you a lot of questions. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to open it up. If folks, if in the audience, if you have any specific questions that have not been answered. Uh, Stephen and Sandy, if you can help and see if there's anything in the chat box that we need to query, things that we need to answer. We did have one question um, from Todd Rubian. It, his question was, when do you feel the pandemic will be over and when can we get back to normal? Hi, Todd. I know, Todd. Uh, nice to see you, too. Um, I think it's coming. Uh, so... I don't wanna say over um, because COVID is gonna stay with us, but I think it's gonna feel a lot more normal very soon. So many things will be open that weren't open before. We, it will be, uh, there will be less requirements for wearing masks and things like that inside in a lot of different places, um, which will make things feel a lot more normal, I think. Um, on the other hand, for those of us who have chronic health conditions or uh, are high risk for complications of COVID or for whom hospitalization would be very uh, difficult, it kind of puts more responsibility on us to take care, to make sure we're protected. Um, and so uh, those of us in that situation will still have to be really careful about wearing masks and uh, and washing our hands. And I don't think that's gonna go away anytime soon. Um, so while things may feel and look a little bit more normal out in the world um, with more things open and less regulation, um, that will put um, sort of the responsibility uh, for protecting ourselves on those of us who have conditions that uh, make us higher risk. Yeah, we do have a one hand raised from Susan David. Um, Susan, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Maybe we don't have a question. Susan, did you have your question? You can go ahead and unmute. Go ahead. I think we're having some problems with their with their with their audio. Um, right now, I don't have any more questions in the chat or in the Q and A. Don't 
Well, sorry we we couldn't get to you, Susan, but uh, it, it did sound like a uh, a clever musical rap. Uh, <laughs> rap. Um, we do have. Dr. Kent. Yeah. Tom, we do have another question. I'm okay. Go ahead and Great. unmute. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yep. Yes. My daughter is seventeen, and um, she just. Um, I'm sorry. We just had our, our checkup uh, at the oncologist and she's cancer free now for eight years. And I was wondering, um, I wanted to get her a booster shot. She's already had her first and second. And I was wondering about the booster shot. Uh, yes, if it's been for, the, for COVID? Yes. Yeah, if it's been five months since her second dose, she can definitely get a booster shot. Okay, yeah, she had her her she had both of them last year, uh, but now um, April she she literally had her first one in April and the second one in May. So you her, got them right away when they came out yeah. for teenagers. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, she can get a booster. Thank you. Sure. Dr. Katanzarite, is, is Achievable um, still doing uh, any kind of booster clinics? Yeah, every Friday at inside the office now. Uh, so every Friday you can come and get a booster vaccine or, or a first dose. Uh, only Moderna. Um, and then most Wednesdays we're doing uh, pediatric uh, vaccines. So for the kids 5 to 12. And that's the Pfizer vaccine. So on that's Wednesday, the Pfizer vaccine Pfizer. for kids five to twelve. Yeah. And so Wednesday is Pfizer day, and Friday is Moderna day, yep. and Tuesday is still for tacos, right? Always. Are there any more questions? I see no hands raised and no questions in the chat. All right. Well, Dr. Catanzaro, I really want to thank you for taking the time and thank Achievable for everything that you've done for our community and continue to do. You guys have been uh, really invaluable, especially during this time. So thanks again for everything that you guys do. Happy to be able to help. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks to our interpreters and thank you, Stephen and Sandy. Thank you very much for helping. <laughs>